So I believe we are going to get started. Hello, everyone. We are so happy to see you with us today. My name is Jan Barker Alexander. I am the Vice President and Dean of Students of Division of Student Affairs here at Pitzer College. I'm excited to be a part of this event, this event, the Presidential Initiative on Constructive Dialogues. How do we talk about Israel and Palestine? President Thacker has created this series to encourage and also to demonstrate respectful and civil discussions and engagement around challenging and important topics, topics of interest to everyone that impact us locally and globally. Mention, I wanna mention that this last week, we had a program called The Three Mothers, how the mothers of Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X and James Baldwin shaped a nation. This was an intergenerational conversation about not only these men, but the civil rights movement, but really it was about their mothers and how their mothers had been erased from history. And as you can imagine, intergenerational means that we had some tough moments, but it was about the constructive dialogue that happened. That event was co-sponsored by the Racial Justice Initiative, as well as the Division of Office of, of uh, Academic Affairs. Now, President Thacker's initiative, we have our two guests, Daniel Sokach and Salam al Mariati who President Thacker, he'll, re he'll introduce them later. But I wanna introduce the seventh president of Pitzer College, Strom C. Thacker, a leader who already in his relatively brief time at Pitzer has engaged fully in the life of the college. And he has demonstrated his commitment to having constructive conversations around challenging, around challenging issues. As someone who has been in higher education for close to 30 years, I have to say, Strom is the truth. He is someone that is willing to sit in the seat of discomfort with our students, and I think that you will see that tonight. I present to you, President Strom Thacker. Thank you, Jen. I appreciate your, your kind words and your introduction, and thank you especially for organizing that terrific event um, last week. That was uh, really moving. I appreciate it. For those of you who did not see the Three Mothers event, it is available. It's been recorded and it's posted on our website, so you can find it there. Um, and I did, it was a great event. I encourage everybody to, to go. Um, Jan's former student, who's the author, um, Anna Malika Tubbs, um, is just an incredibly impressive person. So it's definitely worth it. And our, one of our star students, B. Joyner, was on the panel with Jan and, and Anna as well. So thanks everybody for coming. I really appreciated it. I really appreciate it, excuse me. Um, I really wish we could be there together in person, uh, engaging in constructive dialogues, um, in person in Benson Hall. Unfortunately, severe weather and potential flooding and a state of emergency declared by the governor um, pushed us to, to move the event to an online format. Um, but uh, we're gonna get started in an online format today. And then if, if all goes well, maybe we'll try and do something in person on campus later. If we can impose on our panelists to, to join us again sometime. Um, as Jen mentioned, this is an initiative that I've begun this year. Um, this is the second in the series of ongoing programming. Uh, her, her event was the first one last week. Uh, and it really goes back to a lot of thinking that I have put into um, this notion and this idea for the past few years, but in particular since I got uh, engaged with Pitzer uh, and leading up to my, to my start here. And the idea is that we as a society and the college uh, need to be able to engage each other in constructive dialogues, even, and I would even say, especially when we disagree, and especially when we disagree about contentious topics, like today's topic, for example. Um, rather than talking or shouting past each other, we need to be able to work our way through disagreements and actually learn something from each other, um, rather than trying to knock political points um, and engage in a series of gotchas in this increasingly polarized environment that we live in as a nation, as a world. So, um, you know, I keep thinking about the fact that we're an educational institution, an institution of higher learning. Education is our core mission. It's literally what we do and why we're here. And we can't really learn effectively from and with each other uh, unless we're able to engage in constructive dialogues. And we're gonna be able to learn more from each other um, 
when we disagree in many cases than when we agree. So that's kind of the, the notion behind this. Our student Senate president um, put it beautifully in one of her first speeches of the year. She said, let's cancel, cancel culture, which I loved. Um, and one of the ways that I talk about this a lot also is um, let's agree to disagree agreeably um, and develop a spirit of mutual respect and trust. So um, as you've seen in some of the emails and some of the other things that we've talked about, we're in the process of putting together an organizing committee made up of faculty, students, and staff that will plan more events. But in the meantime, we've started uh, scheduling and, and holding some of these events as well. Uh, students in particular, make sure you check your email. An email went out over the weekend asking for uh, students to express interest in being involved in that committee and some of the planning that we're going to do. So I hope you find today's uh, panel and, and discussion uh, educational, enlightening, interesting, and constructive. Um, so I wanna, uh, before I introduce our two panelists, I wanna thank both uh, Salam and Daniel for joining us today and for participating in this conversation with us. Um, there will be, um, it's really framed as a dialogue between the two of them, primarily with me as a moderator um, and asking questions. And then we'll have a Q and A at the end uh, for uh, the audience to ask questions as well. Uh, it's a webinar format, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. So if you do have questions, put them in the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, and uh, we'll have somebody um, being those to me so that I can ask our panelists those questions. If there are a lot of questions, we may not get all to all of them uh, due to uh, limited time, but uh, we'll get to as many of them as we can and we're eager to, to hear your questions. So um, uh, let me introduce our, our panelists first of all. Salam al Mariadi is president and co-founder of the Los Angeles-based Muslim Public Affairs Council. He's an expert on Islam in the West, Muslim reform movements, human rights, democracy, national security, and Middle East politics. He has spoken at the White House and on Capitol Hill and has represented the United States at international human rights and religious freedom conferences. His writings have appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and the Los Angeles Times. Our other panelist, Daniel Sokach, is CEO of the New Israel Fund and author of Can We Talk About Israel? A Guide for the Curious, Confused, and Conflicted. I've read it. It's a terrific book. I highly recommend it. I learned a lot. Uh, and it was one of the inspirations for this event, actually. Uh, the New Israel Fund is an organization with joint Jewish and Palestinian leadership that, among other things, works to support Palestinians in Israel, human rights groups monitoring and defending human rights in the occupied territories, and for complete equality for Palestinians and Jews alike. Daniel previously served as CEO of the Jewish Community Federation in the Bay Area in Sonoma County, and was founding executive director of the Progressive Jewish Alliance, now called Bend the Ark. He's contributed to the New York Times, the Washington Post, Haaretz, and others. But perhaps Daniel's greatest mark of distinction is that he is the proud parent of two Pitzer students. So um, I hope uh, both of your kids are, are joining us today, Daniel. Um, I wanted to just, before we jump right into the, to the questions, I wanted to just mention a little bit about what this event is and isn't, because I've got a lot of questions um, along the way as we've been uh, planning and leading up to it. So this is not a debate. It does not pit the Israeli perspective against the Palestinian perspective. In fact, quite the opposite. It's about pulling perspectives together. We brought together the perspectives of two people, a Jewish American and an Arab American, who've spent a lot of time working on, thinking about, and talking constructively about the region, including this ongoing and acute conflict. The focus of their conversation will be on the conversation itself, a little bit meta, uh, on how we talk constructively as a community and as individuals about Palestine and Israel. Not to advocate for or against one side or the other, but rather to help us find ways to come together as a community to learn from each other and from considering different viewpoints and perspectives. While we're not bringing Daniel and Salam here to represent Israel and Palestine, neither of them is Israeli, is Israeli or Palestinian, uh, but rather to share their perspectives and experiences as Americans from different backgrounds on how to have these kinds of educational conversations. So to get us started, I'll ask them each to make some brief opening remarks. Um, Salam, why don't we start with you uh, and then move on to Daniel and then I'll start asking some questions. Thank you, President Thacker and thank you, uh, Pitzer College for hosting this very important conversation. I'm really glad to be with my friend, Daniel Sokach, um, who's we've been friends for 
quite some time and been through so many things. This is a very important uh, moment for me personally. So I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to uh, this uh, this group, this august body. Um, I, let me start first and foremost by the fact that I'm an American and we need to start talking about the conflict in the Middle East as Americans. Three American soldiers were killed last week and there's been retaliation. So we are in effect in a war in the whole region. It's not just Israel-Palestine. Uh, the State Department defines it as low intensity conflict and it does not want to escalate the war, but yet it is still war. People are killed. We are bombing places. I believe that as people of faith, like Martin Luther King, since Ms. Alexander brought up uh, the civil rights movement, we should be against war as the way to resolve issues in the Middle East. There is no military solution. My family is from Iraq. We lost members under Saddam Hussein's tyranny and 500,000 Iraqi children under the age of five were killed during the Gulf War. 30,000 American veterans committed suicide after the Gulf War and it's still counting. So there's a tremendous human cost to this. And I believe that we continue to push that aside. My, my wife happens, her, her dad's side of the family is from Gaza. They have lost 60 members from the assault on Gaza so far, uh, 60 members of her family. So we are not in this as a race to see who is suffering more, but we have to end the suffering and we cannot continue with war. Number two, as a Muslim, this week uh, is a very important week for us because this commemorates the prophet's journey to Jerusalem. It's called Isra and Miraj, the journey and the asc ascension, the ascension being from Jerusalem where he met all the prophets and prayed with them. To us, that signifies religious coexistence. And for 1,300 years, Islam uh, protected Christians and Jews in Jerusalem. And in fact, um, it was under Islam that Jews were brought back to the Holy Land since the Romans had completely eliminated Jewish presence from there. Uh, and um, Islam also protected the cross and the church. So that is the legacy I want to bring back to the American mind that is absent from American culture, from American thinking, from even American academia. What is that narrative? And so when I speak with Daniel, I always stress that Daniel, I think people understand your narrative, but they don't understand mine. And so we need the dual narrative uh, in at least understand, we don't have to agree with the narratives. We don't even have to accept them, but we have to at least acknowledge that there's a Muslim Islamic narrative to Jerusalem, Palestine, and the whole region. And quite frankly, at this point of war, uh, I believe that 1.5 billion or 2 billion Muslims feel that this is an attack against them when they see this attack uh, on Gaza. So these are some existential issues that we have to address as Americans if we want to go on with yet another war that could very well lead to World War III and, and more destruction and a, a great, a tremendous cost, uh, not only to the people of the region there, but to us as Americans. So I, I leave you with these daunting uh, issues for all of us, but I think this is where we need to discuss it under such important academic, uh, neutral and objective settings. Thank you. Dante is right. Thank you for um, making us aware of the stakes involved in this. Appreciate that. Thank you, Salam. Daniel. Well, thank you, President Thacker. Um, <clears throat> it's great to be with you and, and with my old friend Salam. Uh, and with all of you work, uh, watching out there um, in virtual land, we're, of course, all sorry that we can't be together on campus, but this is the second best thing and we'll we'll make do. Um, the only tweak I would I would add to what you said, Salam, is that um, it isn't my narrative, um, and 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 that is to say, you know, there are multiple narratives to what is going on in Israel Palestine, just as there are everywhere, and within the Muslim community, the Arab community, uh, the Jewish community, various Christian communities, there isn't a single monolithic narrative in any of those communities. Rather, there are competing, overlapping narratives within each group. 
as well as between each group. And I think that part of what um, Salam and I have tried to do over the uh, astonishing, as it sounds, almost quarter century that we have uh, been friends and have and have worked on these issues together is to try to um, try to clear the way for an understanding that that these various narratives, whether or not you, whoever you are, believe that they're true or not true, that's less important than uh, than than inculcating and developing the ability to listen and hear what is at stake. Uh, it's a term that Salam just used, and one that I think we'll hear uh, a lot this afternoon. Um, the idea of what is at stake, and and f as for me, my position is when it comes to Israelis and Palestinians, uh, putting aside for the moment the point I made about there being mul mul multiplicity of perspectives, even within the camps. You know, my perspective is you have two peoples who are um, with both with deep connections to and legitimate connections to this small place. And uh, these people are uh, are victims. There was a, a good book by an Israeli historian called Benny Morris some years ago entitled Righteous Victims. And what I liked about this, uh, the title, it was a treatment of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. You know, it summed it up. These are two peoples who have been victims of the world, victims of each other, and victims of themselves. And they are both righteous insofar as those claims and feelings are legitimate, and they're a bit self-righteous sometimes, in each camp, you have people who 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 tend to think that theirs is the only narrative, that theirs is the only connection, the only story. And I think what um, what is much more productive and certainly much more interesting to me is trying to, again, develop the ability to understand and empathize and hold with compassion those very real claims. Because the the the, the truth is, and, and one can infer it from your comments, Salam, right, as much as there are extreme extreme views on either side who would like to erase the other, who would like to obviate the history of the other, who deny the legitimate connection that these two peoples, Israeli and Palestinian, uh, have to this little place, this little strip of land, who deny that, you know, who, who, who deny that Muslims, Jews, Christians all have this deep connection. The truth is you will never convince somebody that they don't feel what they feel. Now, you can marshal all the evidence in the world that you want. And by the way, the claims that some in the Jewish community and in Israel make that Palestinians are not authentically indigenous to the to the land are false, just as the claims that some um, on the Palestinian and Arab side and their advocates make that there's no evidence of indigeneity for Jews in the land are also false. But let's say for a moment, let's 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 pretend for a moment that they're both right that you could prove that one side or the other doesn't have the same history that that side claims. What difference does that make when you're talking to people today, real live Palestinians who are suffering and frightened and connected to that place and real live Israelis who are suffering, suffering and frightened and connected to that place. You can't deny their connection. And so the exercise, it seems to me, for us who are watching from afar and who care about that place and who want to see peace in that place, and as Salam say, who want to see an America that lives up to its best uh, and finest founding values, the, the trick is to try <clears throat> our best to really understand, unpack, and feel great compassion and empathy for the connections that each of these two sides has to this place. Because only in doing that, only acknowledge, in acknowledging the, the connection of the other can we begin to find our way to look forward towards some kind of resolution to this conflict. So thank you both. Appreciate it. So um, you both mentioned that you've known each other a while. So um, I'm wondering if maybe you can help us sort of get a sense for how you've worked through these kinds of situations with each other before. So can you tell us about a time when the two of you together had to work through some sort of sticky disagreement? What was it about? How did you each approach it? How did you make your way through to that other side? How did your perspective on the problem perhaps change as a result of um, of that conversation? Did either or both of you change your minds? And perhaps most importantly, what did you learn from that experience? So well, engage, engagement between the two of you in particular. I, Salam, I, I, that question puts me in mind of, you know, back in 2000 and 2001, when you know we had we were we were young younger guys then and we had um helped build a, a muslim jewish dialogue uh, in los angeles uh clergy members and activists and other people and uh the twin blows of the outbreak of the second intifada in israel 
and Palestine, and then 9-11, um, really felt like they were going to um, destroy these efforts. I mean, we weren't alone. This was the case across the country. Um, and there were two great mentors uh, who we had lucked out to sort of um, to have in our in our communities, people who had taken us under their wings and who had trained us. One of them was Dr. Maher Hatout, who was a great Muslim leader in Los Angeles. And another one was Rabbi Leonard Bierman, um, a great Jewish leader in Los Angeles. And these two elder statesmen essentially said to us, this is not the time to walk away. Right. This is the time when it is hardest, when when fears are strongest, when when the horror is at its most powerful uh, and palpable. These are the times where you have to do the uncomfortable thing, um, as Jan said earlier, and you have to sit in that place of discomfort and continue to build bridges. And I feel like, you know, when I think about the situation today, which is as horrible and horrific as anything I've seen in my life in Israel, Palestine, um, I think to myself how critically important it is that we sit in that discomfort and find our ways towards each other. And I feel like that lesson was something that we learned sort of um, very personally and up front and up close from Dr. Hatut and Rabbi Bierman, you know, almost a quarter century ago at another terrible moment. Yeah, you know, I, I remember Rabbi Leonard Bierman uh, fondly because one of his last sermons was, um, and he did it on many Yom Kippur's, but the title of it was Another Yom Kippur, Another War in Gaza. And we all know that what Gaza has endured, I don't think any other, any country uh, would be able to endure. Uh, right now, um, the International Court of Justice says there's plausible evidence that there is genocide and is telling the state of Israel to stop uh, or prevent uh, uh, genocide. Uh, over 30,000 people have been killed. Practically 100% 100, 100 of the population has been displaced. Uh, we don't know how it's going to be uh, reconstructed. But that in and of itself is something that I believe Rabbi Bierman would be speaking out against at this point. And, and this is a time when I think Daniel and I are actually going through a difficult time because I want to hear uh, from the Jewish community a call for a ceasefire. I want to hear... Uh, an end to the atrocities uh, against Palestinians. And I'm not hearing it, uh, at least not institutionally. Um, and I feel that um, that's something that morally we, as people of faith, forget about the fact that we're Americans or I'm from uh, that region and, and Daniel is of Jewish background, but just, just as human beings, um, that we demand an end to this uh, and to hold people accountable because that's the only way the rule of law will be upheld. And for both Jews and Muslims, law is central to the faith. Uh, and I think if we can get closer to that as people of faith, then that will help us get through that moment. But this moment in and of itself, I have to tell you, is, has been very difficult uh, for all of us as we witness what we call a genocide uh, happening in Gaza. Um, and people are looking at us and, and actually accusing us uh, of being anti-Semitic or uh, anti-American. Um, and that's that's been something, unfortunately, that I've had to endure for the, the 40 years that I've worked uh, in the Muslim Public Affairs Council. And there are times that Daniel has come to, to my defense against uh, Jews or Jewish organizations that have tried to silence us. Uh, and I appreciate that. Um, I hope that we can speak together in one voice to, you know, publicly uh, to call uh, for an end to all, all of this, because this is not, this is not helping Israel. This is not, obviously, this is destroying Palestine. This is not helping America. Um, so the closer we can align ourselves like Rabbi Bierman did to faith, and 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 as the Quran says, O oh, you who believe, uh, stand up for justice and be witnesses to God, even if you have to testify against yourself or your parents or your community. Uh, God's claim is greater uh, than yours. So so that sense of justice is something that we have to bring back uh, into the work of 
Muslim, Jewish, pro-Palestinian, pro-Israeli uh, organizations. Yeah, I don't want to um, end, end our conversation right at the very beginning by essentially agreeing with much of what you just said, Salam. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm put in mind of something that a, a New Israel Fund board member, uh, herself a Palestinian, a citizen of Israel, uh, said she's a doctor at Soroka Hospital in the in the south of Israel. And on October 7th, I spoke with her and she had been treating um, people who had been victims of that day, Jewish, Arab, uh, foreigners, Bedouin. Um, and she said to me, she's Muslim, and she said to me, you know, what I realized today, uh, what I was reminded of is that this is not a conflict between, at its core, between Muslims and Jews or Arabs and Israelis. It's a conflict between people who believe that violence is an appropriate means to achieve their ideological ends and those of us who reject that. And I think that the moral clarity of her comment you know, which is not saying she's a pacifist. It's saying that 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 violence must not be the means that you use to resolve these conflicts. Um, it, it resonates to, with with me as a as a home truth that that was voiced in that first day. And today, Salam, I would very um, proudly stand alongside you, calling for a ceasefire, yeah. a return of the hostages, and and critically, uh, a recommitment to the only way out of the dead end that Israelis and Palestinians are in, which is a return to a search for a diplomatic, political resolution of the conflict that recognizes both people's rights to self-determination, both people's rights to live in peace and security, and everybody's rights to having their human rights uh, observed and, and, and respected and dignified. I just want to add, I know we're, we're running long, uh, President Thacker, but just, just to add one more point, the, the other thing that I, I think is important, you know, in, in how J Daniel and I have worked together is we, I, I believe, and I think Daniel will agree, that we both see the existential threats uh, to our communities, uh, communities here in America and communities worldwide, to our Muslim and Jewish communities, respectively, not external threats, but the internal threat of extremism within our faiths. Uh, that's the greatest threat right now, is the the religious nationalism, uh, and and the, and quite frankly, every religious based state has failed. Whether you're calling it an Islamic state, or now uh, a Jewish state, or any sense of Christian nationalism, to me, they have all departed from what faith was about, and that is faith. Religion is the property of the people and should never be a property of the state. Once it's the property of the state, then the state coerces people to, uh, uh, to impose a religious ideology. And that takes us further and further away from the ethics uh, and the principles of our respective faiths. Thank you both, that's great, that's terrific. Um, just a reminder to folks, you're welcome to put questions in the Q&A as we go along, um, and then we'll have them queued up when we get to that portion at the end. Um, let me ask you, you both kind of alluded to this sort of fundamental problem in a lot of these conversations, and that is um, the fact that people may not even accept some of the fundamental facts about a particular situation. They may have completely different um, definitions of, of concepts and of what's actually happening, what the history is. How do you get from that starting point to an engaged constructive conversation about um, such challenging issues? Well, I'll just jump in and say, I have a, a little a formula <laughs> that I think about a lot. Um, and uh, a, a friend of Salam and mine, uh, the, the a professor called David Myers at UCLA, um, once, once formulated this, who, who, he does similar work with a colleague of his uh, to the work Salam and I try to do uh, out there. And, and David um, summarized it like this. He said, there are four principles. Now, remember, this is a university professor also. So I think that in particular, it's appropriate in this conversation because these are, you know, the extremism that Salam just described seems to me to be antithetical to the the job of the university and and President Thacker, what you just said, right? The the and what you said in your introduction and what Jan said, the the necessity of the university being a place where we can talk to each other and challenge each other. Um, I forget exactly how you put it. D disagree politically, civilly, right? This is this is critical. Agree to disagree agreeably. Yeah. Yes, that's it. Much better. And and um, 
And intolerance is the enemy of that exercise. And tribalism is the enemy of that exercise. And so I, I keep the, so here, here are my four, my, my four uh, helpful tips for this kind of work. One is to be informed, to seek out knowledge, right? We live in, 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 in at a time when um, it has never been more difficult to try to um, put together a true understanding about a complex subject because we don't really have many mediators anymore who are um, providing us with what once upon a time um, could be understood as at least a common thread. It wasn't a common thread, right? And there are big advantages to that now. As Salam said, you know, in the Israeli-Palestinian discourse, for most of the last 70 years in this country, the Israeli, um, the Israeli story, the Israeli narrative has been dominant. And part of, I think, the tension that we're seeing now is that is changing. And we're seeing the Palestinian narrative beginning to come to the fore. And that is a good thing. Um, and of course, there are on both sides narratives of intransigence, narratives of extremism. And I think we need to educate ourselves and be able to understand what those are and hopefully reject them and turn to the narratives that are embracing the complexity of the situation. But being informed and seeking out knowledge, which doesn't just mean uh, seeing what you see on social media and assuming you know the whole story, but actually educating yourself about a very complicated, very uh, uh, a, a very nuanced situation, which is full of grays, um, a, a, an intertwined, tortured history between two tortured peoples is 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 step number one. Be informed, seek out knowledge. Number two, um, and this is important for all of us, uh, be modest enough to know that you don't know everything. I suspect we'll come back to that one over the course of the afternoon. Three, and this is important also, <laughs> they're all important, bring empathy and active listening. When you're talking to someone, when when you're in the classroom or having a debate on campus or talking as we're talking now, try not to think about what you're going to say next when your partner or your the person you're in a conversation with is speaking. Try to listen to her or him, um, and 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 so and listen with with deep empathy. Keep in mind that this is not just a political matter. It's not something that's just happening thousands of miles away. As Salam said so movingly, and 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 the same is true for me. These are real things that are happening to real people that people love. And so listen with empathy, uh, listen actively, and remember that this is not just an intellectual exercise. It is one of identity for many. Finally, uh, on, on a related note, because of that, understand the stakes. The stakes are very, very high. They may not be high for you or feel high for you sitting in your dorm room, but for people over there, the stakes are very, very high. And for some of us sitting here in our dorm rooms or on our Zoom chats, the stakes are also very high. So be informed, be humble and modest, be empathetic, and remember that this is truly important stuff that is life or death for many, many people. Let me let me add, I agree with everything Daniel said. Let me just add two things here. Um, number one, uh, when um, Jewish Americans say, you know, what are we supposed to do? Um, in, in terms of what Israel is doing uh, in Gaza now. Um, my answer to them is you need to make peace with your enemy. You don't make peace with your friends. Those are allies. That's, 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 you don't even have to do that, right? They're already your friends. But the challenge is how do you make peace with your enemy? Uh, and the Quran is, is very instructive on this issue. Uh, there's a verse in the Quran that says, good and evil are not equal. So repel evil with that which is good and better. Then the one with whom there is enmity becomes like your closest and warmest friend. And so I believe that religion doesn't really tell us to go and spread the word and convert people to our religion per se, because if if God had wanted, he would have all made us one religion. But he has allowed the diversity, and even within the faith. I mean, you get, what's the joke, Daniel? You get two Jews in a room, you get three opinions. Right. Yeah, you get you get two Muslims True in a room. True of Muslims, too. You get two Muslims in the room, you get 200 opinions. So the, the idea that there's going to be diversity is it's just, is it's it's a given. It's something that we have to expect, and we have to convert each other to friendship to have this uh, discourse. Of course, when 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 blood is shed, 
that 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 is something that um, is very difficult to do, and and blood has been shed, um, and so what what people need to do is understand that our aim is to have to is to challenge our ideas. So our ideas should should never be safe. Our 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 physical being, our mental health should be safe, but our ideas, especially in on campuses, are should never be safe. They should be challenged. And we should think in introspection about our own ideas. That's why I believe going to college is the most amazing experience for my kids, for Daniel's kids. When we went through it, that's when we really started thinking about, you know, how our ideas, our assumptions were wrong, um, you know, from when we were younger. Number two, uh, while there there is wrong, um, there, there's been wrongdoing uh, on so, in so many ways. I think we as Americans have to understand one thing. The United States is actually financing the uh, the genocide against Palestinians. We are sending bombs to kill Palestinians. And to Muslims, they see Palestine as a central part of their identity because of Jerusalem, because when the British invaded uh, and, and got the Arabs to fight the Ottomans, they carved up the Middle East in Sykes-Picot, but they decided to occupy one piece of land. The British occupied Palestine. And so we always felt that the West had looked to Palestine as a way to control the whole Muslim, Muslim world. And I don't think Americans understand this perspective and perception of Muslims. You can even say that it's the wrong perception. It's not, it's not correct, but it is a perception and perception is reality at the very least. So we have to entertain, uh, not entertain, but at least acknowledge these perceptions in order for us to achieve any uh, hope uh, for peacemaking. Uh, and we have to start with people with whom we, we vehemently disagree and we oppose. Um, and I believe that uh, as Americans, there needs to be a movement for nonviolent resistance against war, just like Martin Luther King did. You know, Martin Luther King, He's an interesting figure because we all talk about how he wanted peace and diversity, yes, but he was considered a radical at his time. He was actually a threat to the status quo. And he criticized white moderates because white moderates wanted him to have order at the expense of justice. And to him and to us, justice should be the most important thing that we're working for as Americans and as people of faith. Excellent. Thank you both. I really, that's fantastic. Um, you both have kind of alluded to this, and I think, um, and I just want to preface this by um, by saying, Salam, how sorry I am for um, your wife's loss of so many family members. And I think that those losses and, and the personal nature of those losses points to a larger phenomenon in this issue in particular, which is that, as you both have talked about, so many people in the United States feel connected to this land in one form or another. They feel this connection. But we also have a lot of people in our community who are more personally connected to the region, who have lost loved ones, who have lost family members. And that raises the stakes and, and makes these conversations that much harder. Um, and I know you both have lost loved ones there. Um, how do we bridge across those losses and and the the get a, get over the emotional pain that makes it that much harder to talk about these things on top of everything else that that makes it hard to talk about them you know <clears throat> obviously there's no simple answer for that um although i think points three and four right um sort of bring your empathy and your compassion and your active listening and and remember that the stakes are enormous for me are important but i i was just last week i was on um a zoom call um, with the two sons of a 74-year-old long-term peace activist uh, called Vivian Silver, who was um, murdered in by Hamas in the initial attack on October 7th. She was burned alive in her home. This is a woman who founded a, an organization um, along with a, a, a Palestinian uh, woman called uh, called um, Amal uh, Alsana, called Ajik, and, and more recently, she and Palestinian uh, women founded a, an organization called Women Wage Peace, uh, which I love, and 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 in full disclosure, NIF, is, New Israel Fund, has is given grants to, and these are women saying, look, men have screwed this up long enough, and we're going to take this into our own hands, 
Palestinian and and Israeli women, and we're going to demand uh, uh, that 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 leadership on all sides return to the negotiating table to try to hammer out some kind of peaceful resolution. So she was murdered that day because, of course, you know, um, Hamas didn't discriminate any more in whom they murdered than Israel's, um, you know, horrific bombing campaign has discriminated against uh, who has died in Gaza uh, in the months since then. But I was on the phone with uh, with her sons, and they said we our mother's death was was obviously horrific and very bleak. But we don't want that to be the end of her story. And so, what we want to do in her memory is to create a way to support and recognize Palestinian and Israeli women who are continuing this struggle for peace. And I really was struck by what Salam said about MLK because we think of him now in a sort of benign, um, you know, soft, gauzy uh, light. But of course, he was excoriating these faith leaders in his letter from the Birmingham jail. Uh, and 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 just because he uh, he rejected violence of any sort doesn't mean he didn't, you know, feel anger. And and um but but his response was always that 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 anger has to be at the people who um refuse to see that sort of that that love in its most profound sense, right? In, in, in embodied through nonviolent resistance is the only way uh, to 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 keep our humanity while while working for the kind of change we want to see, and so I was deeply moved, obviously, by these two boys, these these young men who want to use their mother's murder to promote Palestinians and Israelis who are working to stop uh, the direction that that their peoples are are going in and find a new way. And I feel like that example is 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 humbling to me, right? That's rule number two, be, be modest and humble. And, and when you say, what can we do to overcome our own pain? I look to the example of Palestinians and Israelis who have suffered um, the ultimate uh, uh, ho horrific uh, experiences and who say, no, I'm not going to actually uh, now, you know, turn towards rejectionism and violence, but rather I'm I'm renewed in my effort to, to, to build out the bridges towards the other and to and to try to create uh, an alternate future a new horizon for palestinians and israelis that will be different from the nightmare that they're engaged in today um i'm going to bring up something that i i know is controversial but i think it's so important uh for us to to at least acknowledge again i don't expect people to agree with me but you you have to consider it um, when we talk about nonviolent resistance, again, it doesn't mean just coming together and singing Kumbaya and we're all the same. We're not the same. I mean, that's that's the first lesson in life is accept God's will and commandment that we are diverse. The Quran says in 4913, oh, humanity, doesn't even address Muslims, so to, to humanity, oh, humanity, you have been created from a male and a female and made into different nations and tribes, so that you might come to know one another. And the best among you are the, the most honorable. Actually, it says the most honored of you are the ones who are conscious of God. Um, again, back to the words of Martin Luther King Jr., that he'd rather be judged by the character of the individual, not by the color of the skin. Uh, and I think that aligns perfectly with the verse uh, in the Quran. Um, and so one of so when we talk about nonviolent resistance, it's not just saying, oh, let's let's have peace. Of course we want peace. Peace is the outcome. But peace is not to be under enslavement either. Peace is not about being under occupation. Peace uh, is about bringing justice and accountability uh, and having international law. And again, back to the issue of what does that mean for we, for us as Americans, since we are financing this aggression against Palestinians? I believe in the BDS movement, the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions movement. And wherever we can influence, especially Israel, because let's face it, Israel is the more powerful party in this. They're the ones that are um, involved in, in, in the occupation and and, and we are all against uh, uh, occupation. How do we influence it to, to, to end the occupation? 
I don't think we can influence it militarily. I don't think we our, our political leaders are not able to influence it. They they seem to be more intimidated uh, than they are able to lead. Uh, I'm talking about U.S. leaders, um, and so boycott, divestment, and sanctions then is a form of nonviolent resistance that we have to consider. And in academic settings, and I know that in 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 your in, in your college, um, there has been talk about. Uh, supporting BDS, and I publicly endorse uh, the, the P BDS program because I... So here's a good example of an area where we um, we're, we're, we disagree somewhat. Um, uh, but but uh, what did you say again? I keep forgetting the, the formula. Political agree to disagree agreeably. Agreeably. Yeah. Um, look, yeah. the BDS movement, which is, a, <clears throat> is a, 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 a long subject that we could unpack if we had the time, I, I wrote a chapter about it in the book, um, is something that I think, I mean, for me, I'll just speak personally for me. Um, I, to date, have not agreed with it in total um, because of some of the ambiguities around what it says it stands for. But leaving that aside, um, I have been, and so is New Israel Fund, a firm defender of people's right to support the BDS movement, to speak out uh, in favor of it, and uh, a, a, an opponent of its criminalization, even if I don't agree with everything involved. I do agree, by the way, that it's a nonviolent uh, movement, and I think that that for that reason alone, we need to protect and defend people's rights to call for it. Um, and, I'm, and I do find it compelling what Salam said, you know, I mean, I could even put a sharper point on it, right? Um, for too long, people have been told, well, you can't, you know, and I'm speaking now as the person who runs the organization that is the largest support network for Israeli human rights organizations, uh, Arab Israeli Palestinian advocacy organizations. They are told constantly, Israeli human rights groups, Jewish, Palestinian, and mixed. Look, it's, you know, you can't go to the international courts. That That's not acceptable. Obviously, you can't use violence. That's not acceptable. You can't petition the government. That's not acceptable. And so I absolutely understand why people feel like, well, then, then, then you know, what's left to us? And again, that's why I think that aspects of the, of the BDS uh, program are things that I actually don't have a problem with. Um, at the end of the day, what we've seen is an attempt to criminalize BDS. And in this country, uh, it began in 2011 in Israel when a law was passed um, that criminalized, it, it made it a civil offense. At first it was a criminal offense, later made it a civil offense, a tort for anyone, in, in, any Israeli to call for boycott, divestment, or sanctions against Israel. The law then extended that to include any territory under Israel's control, meaning it was denying the right of Israeli citizens to call for a boycott of the, of the Israeli settlements that many Israeli citizens um, and most of the rest of the world, certainly myself included, believe are illegal and, and a, 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 a violation of international law and an obstacle to peace. By the way, the American policy up until Donald Trump was that they were uh, an obstacle to peace. Uh, and up till Reagan, it was that they were illegal. Um, in any event, uh, we have seen in scores of legislatures and states across the country and at the federal levels, attempts to criminalize Americans supporting the BDS movement. I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times a few years ago, uh, shining a light on this and arguing that that was unconstitutional, as well as bad for America, bad for Israel, bad for Palestinians. Um, so, so I think that when it comes to what you call this more controversial issue, you know, there are aspects of that program that I absolutely understand and even support. For me, just to be candid, right, the lack of uh, of any kind of end goal for the BDS movement is, is a challenge because there are many people who are afraid that if what the boycott, divestment, and sanction movement is calling for is a sort of an end to any kind of Jewish presence in, in Israel, that it amounts to an attempt to sort of erase the uh, Israel and the Jewish connection to Israel. Um, I don't believe that a majority of people who support that movement um, subscribe to that, but I do think that it's a good example of why it's very important to try to clarify what our ultimate vision is. And, and for me, that has to always be uh, respect for the right of both peoples to self-determination, as I said earlier, to, uh, to, to lives and peace and security, uh, both Palestinian and, and, and Israeli. Excellent, thank you both. Um, we're getting close to the end of time here. Um, so I wanna make sure we have time for some audience questions here. Um, 
and I, I may throw another one or two of my own in, but I want to get get to the audience questions now. So um, a couple are kind of related here, but but I'll, this one summarizes it pretty well. What can a Pitzer, or I would say a Claremont College student, do to promote an environment for major dialogue like what we're hearing today? In other words, what can a student do to help with this? Well, I mean, I, I again, I think, <clears throat> I don't know who's a asking the question, but again, let me let me talk about it from, from our perspective uh, as, as American Muslims. Uh, we feel that there is a problem with anti-Semitism but there's a conflation of anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. And we can discuss that. I don't want this discussion. I, I know I'm throwing a lot of difficult topics on the table, but that's just to, uh, so that we understand that we- That's what we're here for. Yeah, we have, we have a big problem with that and we can discuss it. Um, and, and again, I, my, our friend David Myers has endorsed the Jerusalem Declaration on Anti-Semitism uh, over the uh, International Human uh, Holocaust remembrance uh, uh, action on anti-Semitism. As says your friend Daniel Sokach. As as Daniel. So so we cannot conflate the two because anyway. So that's number one. Number two, anti-Semitism. There's a lot being done on it. We feel there's a lot, you know, and we support uh, combating anti-Semitism, uh, not at the expense, however, of the right for us to speak for Palestinian rights. And every time we've done that, we've been accused of anti-Semitism. The second problem, as American Muslims. Islamophobia is not just a problem with discrimination and harassment and bullying out there. It is institutionalized within the U.S. policy. Islamophobia is part of U.S. policy because the United States continues to look at the American Muslim community as a suspect community. And it only views Islam as the religion with a militant problem, not Hindus, where there's a rise of Hindu nationalism, not these settlers with the rise of Jewish militancy, even though they listed four people that are- they, you know, they, they started. They started with four people. Okay, that's a good start. A it's good not, start. It's a little start, but a little late and a little, little, but okay. It doesn't, but it doesn't consider it as a national security concern. It doesn't consider obviously the rise of Christian nationalism, even though most terrorist acts in the United States have been committed by white supremacist Christian nationalists. Um, so- it singles out Islam, and as a result, there are watch lists. Uh, there, our bank accounts are frozen. My wife, because she supports a Palestinian charity, when we came back from Mexico, we walked off the plane, and you had Customs and Border Protection in a military escort take us to an interrogation room. That's Islamophobia from the policy. What's happening in Palestine is a part of the Islamophobia within. The, the genes within the DNA of U.S. policy. And, and so the rest of the country follows that. So our problem is twofold, externally and institutionally. And the institutional source of Islamophobia is much worse, in our opinion. And we have to change the national security policy so it doesn't single out any religion. And people say, well, you know, 9-11 happened. So what do you expect people to do? Well, 9-11 Compri the, the, the terrorists comprised of people from Saudi Arabia and Egypt. Did we bomb Saudi Arabia and Egypt? No, these are our allies. We went and bombed Iraq, even though Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11. So there's something else going on in this, uh, in this policy than just fighting uh, terrorism. And the counterterrorism playbook is being used by tyrants uh, like China to uh, oppress the Uyghurs. To, they say the same thing that the United States is. Well, you know, this is counterterrorism, so we have to do what we're doing to the Uyghurs. Um, there's a lot that we have to unpack in terms of U.S. policy on this issue, and, and we, we as American Muslims, feel we need to have a fair, fair hearing, and we haven't had one yet. I would, I would, first of all, I mean, so much of our work together, Shalom, over, especially in the, you know, uh, in the first decade of the of the new century was focused on what what had to be understood as a an assault on muslim americans and i remember you know with the aclu with our little day glow vests coming out near the islamic center you know when ashcroft was demanding then the the you know the bush administration um was threatening to sort of register muslim uh, uh americans so so i completely agree that the specter of institutional islamophobia is something that we all have to be 
ever vigilant against, um, you know, and and we keep quoting Dr. King, which I suppose is appropriate, but you know, um, you know, a, a threat to any of us is a threat to all of us. And once you open the Pandora's box of race hatreds, they'll all come out. And and I think, you know, back to the question, right? So what can, what can people do at, at Pitzer and on the Claremonts? Well, I think that, you know, <laughs> trying to be mindful of of the complexity and the stakes is a huge part of it but also trying to you know you you have to remember that uh the people on your campus are not your enemies and there is no reason that anyone should feel that they have to because they are deeply sympathetic to the plight of the Palestinian people and the rights of the Palestinian people that they have to defend har- you know terror and, and murder. And there is no reason ever um, that anyone who's deeply sympathetic to the plight of the Jewish people and 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 the Israeli people should ever feel it has to defend, you know, uh the 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 the, the what did President Biden himself call it, the indiscriminate bombing that has left tens of thousands of people dead. You, you don't have to align yourself. Uh, and don't have to feel defensive when when those sides are criticized um, for those kinds of actions. But that also means that you can't blame your fellow students because they happen to be Muslim or Arab American, and they happen to sympathize with Palestinians, and they happen to be wearing a kafia. You can't blame them for uh, for what Hamas did and assume that they are anti-Semitic. Um, and it means that you can't blame Jewish students for what Israel is doing. And you can't attribute to uh, American college students who happen to be Jewish lighting a Hanukkah menorah. You can't, you can't, you know, if you scream, if you, if you, if you chant free Palestine at a demonstration, that is, of course, an appropriate and and powerful symbol. And for those uh, in my community who see that as anti-Semitic, I would ask you to rethink your assumptions about what people mean when they say free Palestine. But similarly, if you shout free Palestine at a bunch of college kids lighting a Hanukkah menorah, I would beg you, rethink your assumptions about what you just did. Because in each case, you are blaming American students for the acts of people thousands of miles away. And and those American students who are in solidarity with people on, on either or both sides must remember that you don't have to defend violations of human rights, no matter who is committing them, to be able to be a powerful supporter of the rights of Palestinian people to human rights and self-determination or the rights of Israeli people for safety and security. Let, let me just quote my mentor, um, since Daniel was talking about this issue. He, he you know, he 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 told us in, in several times, on several occasions, he said, you know, the world is not divided into Christians, Muslims, and Jews. The world is divided into stupid people and intelligent people. So work with the intelligent people, regardless uh, of what their faith is or ideology or politics is. So uh, I just wanted to, I just, you know, when Daniel was talking, it reminded me um, that we can't just cluster within our tribes just because, you know, that's, that that to me is the end of what religion was meant for. It was meant to break up the tribal structure and create a community structure. And so, what what do we as a you know as a Claremont community, as a Los Angeles community, as an American uh, community do to have these this discourse? First and foremost, uh, understand what the other side is saying, and then be understood for what you have to promote. You know, Salam. What you both said is just so important because um, I think we all need to remember that whatever our intent might be, we need to be humble and self-conscious of the fact that our intent might not be accurately perceived by others. And the flip side of that is whatever we're inferring somebody else's intent uh, is or is not, um, that perception of ours may not be accurate as well. Um, and that humility in that conversation, I think, is critical. We're, we're at time, but I, I can't resist the urge to, because um, we have a lot of questions uh, that have come in, and a, a bunch of them have kind of clustered around one theme that I do want to ask you about uh, as one final question for both of you. And that is, what can Pitzer and Claremont students do um, not just in conversation with each other, but I think that's maybe perhaps part of your answer, but what can they do to help promote a nonviolent solution to what is going on? 
Um, you want to go first? Yeah. Uh, I, I think, uh, obviously, now that takes another hour. But uh, we'll try to answer it in <laughs> two minutes or three minutes. Only each. one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it takes a whole, yeah. It needs a conference. Um, you know, w when I was growing up in high school in, in Tempe, Arizona, I opened up the textbook, this, my social studies textbook, and they talked about Greek civilization, Roman civilization, and then there's something called the Dark Ages. Uh, and then it went to modern Western, uh, Western uh, uh, the Renaissance movement and Western civilization. So within Western culture, there's been an omission of Islamic civilization. You have to take college courses to really understand how Islam contributed to our current civilization, starting you know, with the simplest but yet most profound example, and that is we use Arabic numerals. Um, and it was the Muslims who invented uh, uh, algebra and calculus and geometry, and it was Ibn Sina, Avicenna, Avicenna who is the, the founder of modern medicine, and Averroes, who is uh, a great astronomer and philosopher, and so on and so forth. Yet Americans don't understand that connection, and that's why the clash of civilizations has, has, ha has had that ramp to, to launch in the United States, and they think that Islam and America are in a crash collision and will always be at war. We don't understand the similarities uh, between Islam and America. So that's one form of nonviolent work is to provide uh, uh, that information, not just in, in college settings, but to the average American so they understand, number one. Number two, we should never allow uh, uh, any scripture to be used uh, to, uh, uh, to impose an ideology uh, or a, a destruction of any other people. Um, and and so that that's something that we should be continuing to talk about. The Quran says, every time they try to ignite the flame of war, God extinguishes it and brings about peace. Uh, Islam says, God invites you to the abode of peace. So let us work. What does that peace mean from an inner peace sense and a social sense? Lastly, again, Nonviolent resistance is not just about um, saying nice things to each other, although I like Daniel uh, and he's a good friend of mine, but it, it's about having these difficult conversations about that, that uh, can be viewed uh, as, as confrontational. And so uh, part of the BDS movement in, in our academic settings, uh, such as the, uh, you know, there's one example that's being discussed in some, some campuses, uh, the boycott of Haifa University for its uh, enabling uh, oppression of Palestinians, I think we need to have a conversation. I publicly endorse it. And I think we definitely have to have a conversation about certain aspects of BDS that are critical to the nonviolent resistance movement for Palestinian liberation. So I would, um, you know, Salam's a much more religious guy than I am, even though um, I'll share with all of you listening that I dropped out of rabbinical school. I guess that's not even though, as, as exemplified by the fact that I dropped out of rabbinical school. Um, but but I also have sort of um, both Jewish and, let's say, more ecumenical founding texts uh, it, it, for, that 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 I come back to um, as Salam does. And one of them is a show that that a lot of you who are students today will not know, but all of your parents will. And the three of us do, which was Mr. Rogers. And Mr. Rogers was a <laughs> a children's television program when we were kids. Um, that he, he he Mr. Rogers himself did a lot of puppets. He did a lot of puppet work. Anyway, I never forgot forgot something that he said on his show once. And he said that when it was for little kids, he said that um, that when he was young and he was very frightened and something terrible had happened, his mother told him, "When you're in a situation like that, look for the helpers." there are always helpers. And so when you ask that question about what can we do, aside from trying to talk and have these difficult and challenging, um, or in some cases, not so difficult uh, conversations, what can we do? Um, I think Mr. Rogers' advice is really important. You, you look for the helpers. Who are the helpers? To me, uh, the helpers are well, there are many of the organizations that, that New Israel Fund supports. There's an organization, a Palestinian-Israeli one, called Standing Together. Uh, young people who believe that um, that they have to reject 
the calls that are coming from leaderships on both sides for further conflict. Groups like Women Wage Peace that I mentioned earlier, another one called Combatants for Peace. Uh, these are former militants, former, former, you know, remember one person's militant is another person's terrorist. So, so former militants, Jewish and Palestinian who have uh, turned away from violence and now work together to uh, to build bridges towards peace. Another grantee of ours is called uh, the Bereaved Parent Circle. These are families who have paid the ultimate price. They have lost loved ones to the violence. And they come together, much as I told you about the, the sons of my friend who was murdered, uh, they come together to try to, to, uh, to build a new horizon and find a new way. And I would say that all of us can educate ourselves uh, about efforts like this, about Palestinians, and Israelis in the region, right? Who are who are working, um, you know, as you said, Salam, often confrontationally within their own societies. By the way, I'll say parenthetically, Salam alluded earlier in the hour uh, to times when I have defended him. Well, Salam's defended me as well. Where we've had to defend each other is against members of our own community who didn't want us working together. Right, who didn't want us to continue uh, to have these difficult uh, conversations. And so I would say that, you know, find the folks over there who are doing the same thing, learn about them and support them. Educate yourselves, right? Um, Rashid Khalidi, who is a professor, uh, wrote an excellent book called The 100 Year War on Palestine. If you are an American, a Jewish American, or someone who is only familiar with the Israeli narrative, the best single book you can go out and read is Khalidi's book, right? If you are a person who is looking from the other side of the spectrum, um, you should go out and, and read Benny Morris's book, Righteous Victims, right? Educate yourselves. Find the folks in the region. You can do it. You're you're online. Um, who are who are trying to have these courageous conversations and trying to confront their own prejudices. And you know. And again, I'll make one last plea. Uh, Salam mentioned the genocide charge at the International Court of Justice. The ICJ is a very serious court. It's made up of very serious jurists, right? You know, before we. This is just my opinion, before we accept or reject or fight or agree with uh, with a position that a very serious court is actually adjudicating, you know, let's let's have the humility to, to say there are some people who are eminently qualified to look at this question, and they are looking at this question. Now, that is not something that a lot of people in my community want to hear, that Israel stands accused of genocide, right? And it is not something that a lot of people in the, the community of support for the Palestinian people uh, may want to hear that that we need to wait and hear what that court says. But those are the kinds of things that enable us to educate ourselves, to become smarter than we are, to to extend our compassion. Um, so those are those are those are my three things. Look for the helpers, uh, educate ourselves and um, and and uh, be courageous enough to accept that what you might hear is not what you want to hear. But the truth is the most important thing to try to arrive at. Excellent. Thank you both. Any final, no obligation here, but if uh, we're going to wrap up, if you have any final concluding remarks, uh, you're welcome to make them. Well, otherwise, I'll just conclude. I just want, I, I think I speak on, on behalf of Dan and myself, uh, President Thacker. I really, really appreciate the, the forum to allow, you know, these different perspectives. I believe this is this is the example we need in every campus for constructive dialogue. It doesn't mean you have to agree. Like you said, we, we have to be able to disagree uh, agreeably. I don't know if I said it in the right way or not, but uh, that's that's what we need. We need more of this uh, throughout our campuses because if we can't be, if we can't um, formulate an example of constructive dialogue, then wh wh why are we surprised when people are just shouting at each other, you know? So I really appreciated the opportunity. Thank you so much. Uh, for for this time and this opportunity. Thank you. Well said, and thank you. And and for those who want to hear Salam and me really disagree about something, I disagree with them about Haifa. Haifa University, which has about 50% uh, Arab student body, um, I, I I don't think is a place that, that we should boycott. But in general, I'm not a believer in academic boycotts. That said, I also don't think that the Israeli universities are the bastions of liberalism that many people in my community uh, and in Israel believe them to be. I think that there's a lot of problems that any of us who uh, understand how some of the research for the nuclear bomb was done at places like Cal and the University of Chicago can understand. But for me, 
uh, academic boycott is is it's one of the reasons why I have some some issues with the BDS program. I don't believe academic boycott is the right way to build bridges between the very kinds of people who are usually at the forefront of of thinking about different horizons. Um, so that's our area of disagreement before the end of the evening. Uh, I just want to echo what what Salam uh, what Salam said, President Thacker. It is such an honor to be here with you, and and I just hope that um, that what what we're trying to do tonight and and what Salam and I are going to do later on again this week and and what so many folks are trying to do in in in, in your president series presidential uh, conversation series is something that will resonate with folks it we do not have to um be, re, re, retreat to our tribes when things get tough it is very hard to reach out your hand towards the other uh, but but what you find is I think that you actually become more human in doing it. And you remember why it is there are universities uh, to go to. And so um, so thank you. And and what an honor and a pleasure to be uh, to be here with with my dear friend Salam uh, during yet another terrible time for our peoples. Yeah. Well, thank you both. I'm just so grateful for you bringing this conversation, this dialogue to our community. Um, it's the first of many, um, and I look forward to more, um, perhaps even including you both, um, but more for our community as well. So I just wanted to thank um, uh, Jan Barker-Alexander uh, for emceeing tonight, Jim Marchant for helping us plan the, the whole senior staff team, but also our IT and communications team for making it happen. And I want to thank especially um, our guests, our audience, uh, for joining us today and, and apologize again for not being able to do this in person. Uh, but um, we want to at least uh, keep the momentum and, and keep the ball rolling and look forward to many more opportunities to have conversations like this in person. The next event that we're going to host, just to preview it a little bit, you should be getting something uh, in your email relatively soon. On Hold your calendars on February 20th, probably around the same time, late afternoon. It's a Tuesday, two weeks from tomorrow. We're going to be um, offering a screening of a film called The Barber of Little Rock, it's been nominated for an uh, Academy Award in the short documentary uh, category. It's one of five nominees. Um, and it's, well, I won't go into too much detail, but it basically goes through uh, the story of a barber in Little Rock named Arlo Washington, who uh, opens up a barber school and then also sees a, um, an acute need in his community, in the Black community in Little Rock, for banking, for financing, uh, that simply isn't available in the neighborhoods where his um uh, he, he and his colleagues live. And so it's short movie, about 32, 33 minutes. We're going to bring the filmmaker and Arlo Washington himself, the star of the, sh of the film, uh, to campus for a screening and a panel with the Q&A. Um, so that'll be the next in our series. It'll be jointly between the Racial Justice Initiative and uh, the Constructive Dialogues Initiative. So mark your calendars for February 20th. Um, and I hope to see you there and I certainly hope it's in person. Um, but thank you, everybody, uh, and thanks especially to um, to Salam and Daniel for uh, bringing your perspectives here, um, both when you agree and especially when you disagree. Um, thank you for modeling that for us. Really appreciate it. Um, and thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank Have you. A, stay dry and stay safe. Thank you. See you tomorrow, Salam. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>